There's Jim Beheim. Let's turn to the Big 12, the best conference in college basketball, the Big 12. Today at the Octagon in the Little Apple, top 10 showdown between Texas and Kansas State. Got to be honest. Got to be honest. This is the result that raised my eyebrows the most today in college basketball. Because for Texas to go in there, I know, you 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 have a look on your face, Rob. But for Texas to go in there and beat Kansas State, man, man, Rodney Terry could be argued as the best coach in this sport over the last two months because nobody's had to deal with the circumstances that he's had to deal with. The Longhorns are 19 and 4. They win 69-66 at Kansas State. What a win for Texas. I, I the job that he's done to be able to keep everybody engaged, right? Like how often do you see interim coaches show up and it turns into, you know, you got the substitute teacher and you know, teaching class. He's got like there hasn't been a let off at all. In fact, you can probably make the argument they're playing better with Rodney Terry there than they were under Chris Beard. And uh, with how tough that this conference is, with how difficult the Big 12 is, to be heading into Fall Gallon Fieldhouse with a one-game lead still in the league is something that is just so incredibly impressive. Like I, Jerome Tang has got to be in the conversation for National Coach of the Year. TJ Otzelberger has got to be in the conversation for National Coach of the Year. Matt Painter probably going to end up being the national coach of the year because of what they've done there. But I don't know how Rodney Terry doesn't at least get a mention somewhere, right? Like if we're doing a first team, all America coaches, RT has got to be on there somewhere because when you can do that, when you are not the guy that everybody committed to, when you are not the voice that you were normally expected to hear, when you are not the guy that put together the roster, right? You are not the guy that Texas decided they were going to invest all this money in to be able to try to rebuild their basketball program. And you step in unexpectedly and keep it going. Like just, I can't say enough about the job that he's done at Texas. And uh, you know, I, I'll be very interested to see. There's still a lot of time left and a lot of basketball left to be played. But if things kind of carry out and you finish somewhere in like the top two or three of the Big 12 and you do you don't lose in the first round of the Big 12 tournament, you don't lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I don't know how he doesn't get the job. I don't know how he doesn't get the full time job. I think he's done enough to prove that he at least deserves a shot. Right. Is that is that crazy? Because it doesn't feel like there's that buzz. No. Yeah, I, I think if they, you know, you you. It'd be hard not, to, you know, in my opinion, it'd be the right thing to do. Just and because Rodney has a lot of pride in Texas. He was there for nine mm-hmm. years as assistant. I mean, when you start talking about guys like Booby Gibson, LaMarcus Aldridge, uh, you know, TJ Ford, Kevin Durant, Avery Bradley, Tristan Thompson, like he, he's there and involved with all of those guys from a recruiting standpoint, from a relationship standpoint, like, those guys would come, they would probably be extremely excited um, if Rodney Terry's name, you know, the full-time head coach, you, you got, you know, that alumni base and all those guys, you know, PJ Tucker you know, back. So he's, he's got a, a huge amount of pride in the program. He's been there. He helped, he helped, you know, uh, for that era really had an integral part in it. He has 10, 11 years of head coaching experience. It's not like, you know, he was uh, some rookie that hasn't done it before. And um, and he's got the locker room, the current locker room, right? He, he's done a tremendous job of leveraging those relationships to get those guys to, to do what they're doing now. So, Laval, that's the complicating factor to me here. Um, it's twofold. One, all these guys in the locker room, how many of them are gone after this year, right? Like, he's got a bunch of seniors, a bunch of fifth-year seniors, couple guys that may end up going pro Dylan Mitchell's probably a one and done kind of a player. Right. So it's not like you're going to have that same group back. And we have enough of a sample size of him as a head coach, where if he was currently right now at UTEP, right. And someone else was the interim coach and the same thing happened. And you came to the end of the season, you had to make the hire based off of his resume as a head coach. I don't think that he gets on that list. So that's, that's to me where it's kind of like, well, look, the job that he's done, means that he should get that like he he deserves a, a bare minimum to be like involved in whatever like the finalist of interview fit interviews is that you do maybe he deserves a job at the same time if he wasn't currently in that job 
I don't think that he'd be getting the call. So it's like, I understand why some people at Texas might be a little bit hesitant, but based off of what he's done and the ability he's done, I, even if it's something as simple as give him like a, a contract with a, a small buyout, right? You got to give him a shot if this continues. Now, if the bottom falls out and they end up losing every game from now on and, you know, you end up finishing like six. That's in the big not going to happen. A, it's a different conversation. I don't think that's going to end up happening. I think that they you are for what? real. I got to tell yeah, you something. In those, in those instances, it's like, did Steve Fisher deserve the job at Michigan? Probably not. Know. And he won a national <laughs> title, which is, Brad, which is Brad Stevens. Did, he, did Brad Stevens deserve the job at Butler? Like he'd never been a head coach before, mm-hmm. but he was there. He was an integral part of the program. And so he just, you know, kind of continued on and built it up to another level, which I know Texas, you know, what are the expectations and what do they want in, in terms of, you know, the administration? I don't know the answer to that, but there's examples out there of a guy getting an opportunity and running with it. He he's he's earned he's earned a shot at it. That's all I'll say. He's earned a shot at it. It's kind of interesting and ironic that following the Chris Beard saga and fallout, I would argue that Texas has been one of the quietest teams in terms of drama, and they've been actually not talked about the way a top 10 team would be talked about because Mm -hmm. of the fact that the Beard storyline has ruled so much. And yet these kids have just kept their heads down. They've kept working. This staff has unlocked something with this team. They've steadily gotten better. It's the power of seniors, quite obviously, as Laval has brought up. But I really do think that there's some irony to a team that dealt with the distraction of all distractions in losing their head coach during the season. And since all of that, they've been one of the least talked about actual teams for how good they are in college basketball. And they just keep winning. It's almost as if Rodney Terry and staff have utilized all that drama and said to to their guys, you know what? Everyone thinks you're going to fall off a cliff. Show them that you're tougher than that. Don't give in to the pressure. That That's at least the way that I see it here. No question. No question. Just thrown in that scenario. No, no, no. You, nobody imagines that scenario. And for Rodney to do what he's done with it, you know, just I mean, I'm happy for him, you know, thrilled for him. And, and I think the best is just to come, like, for the rest of the season. Some as kind long of as they get some throat lozenges. Just get that guy something for his voice, man. You hey. gotta get him something. He goes from the octagon of doom, and two days later, he's got to go to Fog Allen Fieldhouse, and he's already hoarse. He needs more tea. He needs throat lozenges. He needs something, man. Because my guy, my guy, on a good day, RT does not have a. Uh, he, he he could be raspy on a good day. <laughs> so elsewhere in the Big Twelve, top fifteen showdown. There were two top fifteen showdowns today in college basketball. Both came out of the Big Twelve. It, in Ames. It's like every day. You could say that every single day, Fanta. Of course. It's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Iowa State 68, Kansas 53. Yeah. Rob, does, does this say more about the Cyclones to you for the good? Or are you concerned about the Jayhawks? Uh, I, th- I think it says a lot about the coaching and the identity that, that T.J. Otzelberger has developed um within that program because they completely melted down on the road against texas tech uh the only team to lose to texas tech in big 12 play this year uh blew a 23 point second half lead like it was kind of ugly on monday and then you come home and you get kansas and there's a chance for that thing to kind of go bad right and they just smacked it that was never really a game it was never really all that interesting uh, no one other than Jalen Wilson did anything for Kansas. And to me, as impressive as that was for Iowa State, like I got I got red flags, I got warning sirens, I got buzzers going off. Uh I'm Kansas got scored 53 points tonight, right? They got 26 from Jalen Wilson. Players not named Jalen Wilson on Kansas scored 27 points tonight, were 10 for 28 from the floor. They were three for 15 from three. Uh if he doesn't get help, Laval. I don't know what Kansas can do because they already can't run stuff through the, the, the post the way that they normally do. They don't really have a point guard that could take games over. They kind of have the, sometimes a little bit of an Andre Jackson problem where nobody guards Dewan Harris. And if 
if you can't get Grady Dick going off, if Kevin McCullough is not going to be a guy that's a threat offensively, if those two little guards off the bench can't do anything, Pettiford and Yesifu, like, where are you getting offense from? No, I thought, it, you know, to John's point, I thought it was said more about Iowa State's the defense, you know, just mm-hmm. 20 turn, they forced 20 turnovers and uh, scored 19 points off the turnovers and, you know, it disrupts your flow. So with Grady Dick getting into the flow of, what they normally do, like you can't, they keep you on one side of the floor with the no middle and and they fire off from the baseline. And and so Dewan Harris's ability to play and pick and roll is is kind of, you know, null and void in a game like this. And so, you know, Iowa State just takes you out of your stuff. Um, then you need a, a guy that can just make plays, you know, all the way around and, and kind of figure that defense out, which, which is easier said than done. There's not a lot that have done it. And so, um, yeah, that, that was the thing that stood out to me. Just, you know, they jumped on him early. Jalen Wilson, you know, gave his best effort. But that defense just, you know, it disrupts everything you do. You have to – you almost have to have a plan of attack specifically for that instead of playing the way we normally play. I think Iowa State is also one of the nightmare teams to play in college basketball. They really are. And beyond their defense – the way that that team runs half court offense, the pace at which they run their sets at is really impressive. They know who they are. It's not pretty. It's not necessarily glamorous. They play their games in Ames. You ever been there? It's out of, it's out of control. It's, 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 you feel like when you walk into the building, it's like a cult following. That's what the team has. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they just, the, the fans oh, yeah. worship. I've been there. I've been there with an Iowa on the Iowa bench. Imagine that. If you can imagine that game. <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> oh, geez. Wow. Hilton, Hilton magic is real. It's real. And, did you, hey, did you, you hear guys, them today? Every time that Grady Dick missed a shot, the crowd started chanting, you suck, comma, dick <laughs> which is just amazing they, well, just, they only they only made five free throws and they only made seven threes it wasn't like the crazy. offense it's the defense but it's their defense it, is legit that's a that to me is the team like remember last year they went through their lull and then going to the ncaa tournament people were unsure but then they still made the second weekend mm-hmm. i gotta tell you iowa state is the team to me guys were presented by Bet Rivers, that I would head over to the window. I don't think that they are a Final Four team, okay? However, if you told me that I had to pick five teams, four or five teams, to make the Sweet 16, to me, like, Iowa State's just going to be there. They're going to be there in a regional semifinal because when you they're one of those teams I think you would agree coach that in the NCAA tournament especially for opponents who haven't seen them play I think it's really hard to simulate who they are and what they do in practice yeah no that that's the thing like it's just I remember uh when Michigan with coach Beeline you know he's an offensive genius when they play Texas tech and beard was there with the no middle stuff, you know, they, they struggled simply because you don't face that in the, in the league, in the big 10, nobody does that. And you can't simulate it in practice. It's, it's like, so now you get out there and you're trying you're kind of figuring it out on the fly. You had a plan, but it's a little, it's a bit more disruptive than you thought. And, and you're adjusting as you go, which is, uh, you know, which is not easy. And guys have to really be locked in together uh, for teams in their league, you know, they've they've seen it, you know, so they they game plan over, you know, the course of a couple of seasons playing against it. Rob, if you had to right now go to the window and put all your stock on one of these big 12 teams, all right? I know it changes day to day. It's going to surprise like, you. It's going to surprise who are, you. Who, I say. who are you still? Who are you still the most bullish on? It's going to surprise you when I say who it is. The Baylor Bears. Yeah. We are, no one is paying enough attention to the Baylor Bears right now. No one is. They have, I would argue, uh, the best backcourt in college basketball right now between Adam Flagler, Keontae George, and LJ Cryer. 
right? Two of those wow. three guys go off every night. Right? Yeah. Two of them, two of the three of them go off. Um, Jalen Bridges has been playing better. He had 18 points tonight. Uh, he had a couple threes tonight. It looks like he's starting to kind of turn the corner. And most importantly, yeah, Jonathan Chamwa Chachwa is back. He, uh, almost a year to the day from he suffered such a devastating knee injury. It was, he tore the ACL. He, I think he tore the PCL. He tore, he basically tore everything that you can tear um, in a knee. There were questions about whether or not like this kid's ever going to play again. Uh, he gets back on the court at 13 points tonight, or I'm sorry, 13 minutes tonight, eight points, four boards. And he provides them with something they don't have right now in terms of a level of athleticism and a lob target and a role guy and just, He's he's such a important piece for them. I think culture wise, like he just there's there's something that he brings to that team that you're not going to get anywhere else. And you combine that with great guards, and now your four man starting to make some shots. Like they're they're really really good. And if they did not lose a one possession game at home to Kansas State, and the overtime game by one against TCU, you know they're basically two shots away from being a first place team in the Big Twelve right now. That they can go, man. And they got Scott Drew. He solves a lot of problems. I'm with well, you. Did I sell you? Yeah, I'm buying that. Guards. The, 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 I, I think Kante George is like, I mean, he, you know, you watch Hood Shafino today, earlier, and Kante George, you know, two talented, talented freshmen. Guards. <laughs> I mean, Keontae George is a really good player for, especially for his age. He's mature um, in his game. His game is a mature who, game. Who would you compare him to? We had this conversation the other night. Who would you compare him to? That's a that's a good question. Um, you know, I don't. Top of my head, he's got a, a little bit of Darren Darren Williams in him. It's not maybe a shifty, but he's you know he's got the size. He, he can shoot it. Yeah. Uh, I think he's got a poise about him. I don't know. That's a good question. That was the first guy that popped into my head. So I don't know if that's accurate, but it was his first. One of the guys that, that we were talking about was Brad Beal. Just his ability to kind of, he's not quite as explosive as Brad, but his ability to kind of, you know, play on or off the ball. Some of the work of ball screens, he kind of gets to where he wants to go and he can rise up and can, can, can make the shot that he needs to make when he gets to his spot. So I don't even know if that's a, a perfect comparison either, but. See, he, here's what I like. What I like about this Baylor team is, in the past, we talked about how tough they were and how much they would make it a street fight and just, just how, how great they were on that end of the floor. And then the offense would, would come along, and it did when they went on their national championship run. But I do think it's interesting because this team, to this is Scott Drew's Best offensive team. They're third in Ken Palm adjusted offensive efficiency. That that backcourt is ridiculous, as you just said. And now with Big John back, he, he is a guy that that just helps them automatically in the columns that you look at what Baylor's typically known for. So what fascinates me about the Bears is Here's a team where offense has been well ahead of their defense, but that's where Scott Drew is the man because you can feel last year, whereas Baylor experienced the downfall, the injury bug in college basketball. I knock on wood as I say this. It's almost like things have come full circle here and they're going the other way. Timing is everything. And Baylor represents that in college hoops. And I'm fascinated to see if this team can get everything clicking together and could show that they could just be solid defensively. Can you turn into a top 50 defense? Because if they get that going and they, they're together on that end of the floor, you combine that with their overall guard play. Rob, you said it. Two of the three guys are going off per night, whether it's Cryer. Flagler, George. The only reason why it's not all three is there's only one basketball, right? So I, I really, I'm with you. I'm buying everything that that you're putting down there. I would I, not be surprised. I, got, I, got I would not be you. surprised if I would not be surprised if Houston and Baylor met for the national championship, an all Texas final. 
in in Houston. That would be a lot of fun. Um, one more team I want to mention from the Big Twelve: Oklahoma State. They're they're a tournament team right now. I don't think people yeah. realize that they're a tournament team right now. I be my man. They're they're fourteen and nine overall. They're going to end up being the top thirty five team in the net once they, once everything uh, readjusts. They have four quad one wins. They have an ugly loss to uh, Southern Illinois, but they beat TCU today. They beat Iowa State. They beat West Virginia. They won at Oklahoma. They yeah, in. are they were the they were one of the first four out on uh, on fielding the sixty eight before beating TCU at home. They they are a tournament team. Shout out to Mike Boyd, man. Like he he was he was he was fucked over by the NCAA last year with the tournament ban and everything. They got the the, the way the way those uh, that that ban came out was just so unfair um and i am so happy for my like i don't i don't think i've ever met anybody that doesn't like mike no he's the best yeah <laughs> i don't think I'm, i don't think i've met anyone that doesn't like mike so i'm 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 going to check happy. on me the other day just to check just to see how i was doing I'm like well, hey, he, 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 he's hosted a show I'm, with us before i'm undefeated he's you got games to play brother <laughs> yeah he's he's hosted a field of 68 so he probably called you up and was like look i want to make sure that you're not taking my spot in, in march <laughs> 